Blessings of the life giving creative spirit be upon you and upon your family. My name is Melvin Ishmael Johnson, coming at you live from the Coon Round Studio. Uh, now, before I get uh, rolling today, I'd just like to mention that yesterday we lost uh, someone very important to the Skid Row community, General Jeff Page. And just a little moment of silence for Skid Row community activist, hip hop historian, General Jeff. Okay, now this week on the Cool Round Report, an in depth interview with rapper Von T. And, uh, Channing Von Taylor, better known by the stage name Von T, is an American rapper, DJ, singer, and songwriter. In January 2019, after premiering the music video for his song, Turn Off the Lights, he became a viral internet meme, accumulating over a million views on world star hip hop due to his many different styles wearing his custom helmet and army discrimination and military background. Von T is an active captain in the United States Army. In 2019, his single entitled Enough, featuring Icon, became his most successful single to date and still rapidly spreading across the internet. Von T, welcome to the Coon Round Report. Hey, I appreciate you having me here tonight, man. It's a blessing to be here, Melvin. It's a blessing to be on your report. Uh, hopefully, y'all are safe out there. I'm out. I'm, out, I'm located out here in uh, in Georgia. You know, saying that's where I'm at right now, and I just appreciate y'all having me on here tonight. Appreciate uh -huh. it. So glad to have you on and get a chance to meet you in person across the internet. Look, can you tell us a little about your life before the military? Uh, yeah, like um, so. Um, I've always been, my, my, my family is a military family, uh, have a military background. Uh, my father served over 20 years in the military. Uh, I have a sister that's in the military, many of uncles that are in the military. Uh, and for me, you know, I, I kind of didn't join the military uh, until I was uh, well into being an adult. So uh, by virtue, you know, I had to find something that I like to do in the meantime. Uh, my life before I had joined, because I joined in the uh, reserves first uh, when I enlisted, I was an enlisted soldier. Uh, I was always kind of stepping in and out of the scene as far as entertainment goes. Uh, did my hand in doing DJ and work for a while, made a couple of beats, uh, played extras in movies, did a little urban wear modeling, uh, talent shows and whatnot, and just really just trying to just get my name really established, just trying to get comfortable with being uh, being out there in that lifestyle and just uh, just knowing the ins and outs of it. Uh, but then when I joined the military, I didn't know for sure if I wanted to be an active duty soldier right up, right out the gate joining. Uh, but I do know I wanted to join because of 9-11. I wanted to give back at least at least at a minimum four years of my life to uh, to the country that I felt like uh, at the time cared about my well-being. 
and uh, me benefiting from the protections of just being able to make it as a black man in America. So I just wanted to give those four years back, whether that was reserve or active duty, but I did pick reserve because I wanted to still kind of on the side of my own time, kind of pursue uh, the entertainment realm uh, at the same time, you know, wanting to give back a little bit to the, to the country. So, uh, so that's kind of like, that's kind of like, like the gist of where I kind of started at with all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in a way, I kind of come from a military family, too, because out of my, uh, it was uh, seven males and two females, six of us served in the military, you know, I had uh, three that served in the Army, two that served in the Air Force, and I served in the uh, United States Marines. So what was your skill? Your service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What was your skill training, your MOS um, um, in the military? Yeah. Uh I have a real diverse background when it comes to the military. Um, I've been in for 18 years. Uh, September 10th made 18 years. Uh, and so that is the, uh, the anniversary of, my, of me joining just past. I've actually had three different MOSs uh, since I've been in the military. When I joined, when I was enlisted, I was in 88 Mike, uh, which is transportation. Uh, you know, for all my transpo heads out there, they know exactly what that means. Uh, you know, we, we trucking and we moving stuff along and, and delivering stuff. Uh, that was my, my job when I was deployed. Uh, saw stuff get blown up. Saw, you know, a lot of stuff go wrong. Uh, gained a lot of experience from that. And then uh, went to college. Uh, and then, you know, I decided I wanted to chase the dream of being an officer as well. Uh, told myself when I went to officer school, I said, hey, if I, get, if I get a good score, if I get the job that I want, then I'll go active duty. The pay is good. Uh, entertainment's kind of slow right now, but I kind of put it on the back burner, but didn't forget about it. Uh, so when I actually uh, went to college and I graduated in commission, I, I transitioned over from an 88 mic and I moved over uh, to a 74, uh, a 74 alpha, which is uh, which is a chemical officer. So I, I was a chemical officer then as a lieutenant, uh, did my time as a lieutenant chemical officer, and then it sent, uh, eventually when I got promoted to captain. Uh, I transitioned over from 74 Alpha to 35 Delta, which is an all-source intelligence officer, which is currently where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Let, let's talk a little about um, um, hip hop rapping. First of all, how would you define hip hop? Uh, well, for one, like uh, I, I would define hip hop as like the core. It is like the core of music. It's where, I, it's where essentially like everything for me really started off at. Uh, I feel like in my own personal opinion, hip hop is where music starts. Uh, all these, most of these genres that are out uh, are, are a derivative of some sort of hip hop. Uh, and we see it now, you know, we see it in the commercial. I mean, it's, it's, the, leading, it's the leading sound of, of where we're at right now, uh, this year moving forward. And, it, and I don't see it falling off anytime soon. Every commercial that plays on TV, uh, has our music in it. It's cherished and, and, and celebrated amongst uh, everybody, all the cultures. It brings in the most money, uh, brings in the most audience. It has the most energy. Uh, for me, it, it's just, uh, I think there's a little bit of hip hop in everybody, just honestly, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. well, well, is there a difference between hip hop and rap? Can you talk about that? Or is it just the um, uh, same name for different things? Yeah, no, there, there's a there's a big difference between uh, hip hop and rap. And actually, you know, rap, rap is different from trap. Uh, trap is different from rap. Rap is different from hip hop. Hip hop, I feel like is the father. Uh, it would be one of the fathers of, of, of these other genres that has popped off. Uh, and, you know, hip hop is where a lot of the legends has really paved the way for a lot of a lot of rappers to really get into the game and really try to try to get their name, their name, their name known out there. Hip hop is very lyrical. Hip hop is very battle worthy. Hip hop is very respected. Uh, you know, it, it takes a lot to be considered a hip hop artist. Uh, a lot of people be, can be considered rappers. It takes a lot more effort to be considered a, a hip hop artist. Uh, so I think there's a clear difference uh, in that. Hip hop is, is, is definitely uh, more lyrical. It can be, it's more deep. Uh, hip hop sends a message for the most part. Uh, you know, rapping doesn't necessarily have to send a message, you know, rapping, you can rap and you can rhyme A, B, C, D together, but to be a hip hop lyricist, like you got to come with a message. 
Mm-hmm. Now, how did you first get off into uh, hip hop? Uh, I would say like, for me, like I got involved really in hip hop was probably, I say like in high school, uh, you know, I used to sit around with some of the, some of the kids who used to just kind of sit around and we used to do like the, uh, the beatbox on the, on the, uh, on the tabletop, you know, when we wasn't doing much in school, you know, maybe it was a slow day or something like that. And we would all used to sit around and just really get involved in hip hop and just really just start freestyling. So it really just started with the freestyling and really just, you know, learning how to do the words and put the words together and learning what you want to say. And you just keep moving from there. Uh, you know, a lot of those kids, there's some of those kids that I used to roll with back in high school were a little bit of knuckleheads, you know what I'm saying? But that's what we used to do. We used to, we used to just sit around and just really just practice it. Uh, and that's where it started off, started off really in high school. Mm-hmm. But now, who, who are some of the rappers that uh, influenced you and influenced your style? I, I think for like, for like hip hop, hip hop and rappers, like I feel like I kind of pull from, uh, from all the genres. I feel, I feel like I pull from a lot of the new, the new artists that are kind of like uh, leading that spearhead on uh, on on uh, on hip hop and rap right now, but I also look up to look up to some of the older rappers. Uh, you know, I look up to some of the dynasties that are out there. You know, like uh, uh, you know, like Death Row. You know, I look up to uh, I look up to Maybach music. I look up, you know, what I'm saying uh, Puff Daddy. You know, what I'm saying, and a lot of those people who really just Jay Z, the people who really just from the hip hop core and really people who just started it from the ground up and kind of built their empire around it kind of just paved that road for a lot of the a lot of the younger artists that are a lot of the newer names and the attractions that are out there getting to it right now like Lil Baby, uh, Tiger, uh, you know what I'm saying, Chris Brown, Drake, like a lot of these other artists that are really out there doing their thing and really like leading the spearhead image of and the sound of what, what hip hop is. But it all started with the with the older people that I look up to, but I still look up to the younger generation and people in my era as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, let's, uh, uh, you know, it, it, um, I, I just want to mention something earlier because I, I, I was going to do a, a save the date, but I'll, I'll do that at the um, end of the show, kind of uh, slip past me. But look, I looked at that video, Turn Off the Light. I thought that was a, 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 a very creative, professionally outstanding video. So what we're going to do now, we're going to play the video, Turn Off the Light, and then we'll come back and discuss the uh, military objection to it. So right now, Turn Off the Light. Zines. I've been up since dawn, see the night before I had ran up. That chick I woke up a bed, she said I fucked up her head, so I dropped her at the salon. I don't want a hooked on and I don't need no add on, ain't no point to lead you on. So when I hop up in that candy, cut a coat of crayon, I hit the gas, then I'm gone. You see, I been with my niggas, some killers, some niggas been riding with fingers on the pistol, the trick a drug dealer. So we deliver with certainty, watch your orders, we carefully back, me moving that harmony, Michael Jackson thriller. All of us standing like pillars, you moving just like the river, you looking real up, I'm the walking caterpillar. That's just a typical day, and at night, with the eye, we shine bright, so, 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 so. Turn up the lights, hey, we shine it so bright, so bright. This money I blew, hey, we bang it all night, hey. Said turn up the lights, hey, we shine it so bright, hey. This money I blew, hey, we hear the delight. I swear to God, every day like this, symbiotic music be the gang and that be my clique. So tell me, who 
Who you really, really rolling with? I would tell you about all of my jewelry they played in the fit. My diamonds, huh, they not counterfeit, but don't you run up, try to snatch a zapper, stopping all the chatter, zapper, alligator, snapper, hit a nigga, turn him in the castle, make you see the faster when I hit you with the tracker. Uh, down, I'm like a master, you be quick, but I be faster. You be pistol, check your bladder while I sit and hold it. I'm running straight up while you stagger, your little stats are coming shatter. On cute dog and ain't no capper, you gave up, you folded. I got the moves, I'm like my jagger, hear you cheating and you chatter. What you saying, it don't matter how that satellite. Baby, just come, this how you walk, baby, but just like a star. Overseas, like the Navi world star, just, 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 just turn up the lights. Hey, we shine it so bright, so bright. This money I blow. <laughs> great video, great video. Let's talk about that video for a moment. How did it uh, come about, you know, uh, for some of the people that help you put it together? And what is your procedure for putting your video? You write a script first or, or what? Uh, so like uh, for, the, for, the, for the songs that I have currently that are out, uh, like I, I'm real, I'm real word cautious on what I do right now, just because uh, when I came out as a music artist, I did want my name to stand out for itself. I didn't want it to be tied to anything that had to do with the government. So I didn't talk about anything political, didn't put no soldiers in the video, uh, didn't shoot it nowhere near post. Uh, don't pass out business cards or, or try to get my name known on post. I wanted my name as an artist to stand out for itself. Uh, for the music video, for the, for the song itself, the, the song I wrote first, and that was really just I just really wanted to just make a club song, something that people can just go to the club and just have fun, something that'll make people dance and just, you know, had a long work week. You want to forget about uh, your work week. You want to have a good a good weekend, you know, go out with your friends and have fun in the club. Uh, when I put the uh, when I put the treatment for the video together, I told my videographer I did not want to shoot it in a strip club. Uh, everybody who was in my video, uh, who was on screen, dancers and everybody, they were all paid act actresses. Uh, and they all had coverings on. Nobody was a. Uh, there was no nobody nude in there at all. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was just it was just like a real good, just like a feel good video. Shot out in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, you know, shot out way away from where I was stationed at, uh, which is uh, um, Augusta, Georgia. Uh, you know, on my own time, uh, my own my own money. You know, it was a hobby at it was a hobby at the time. I just really wanted to put a visual behind my single. Uh, and I did it and I had no, I had no expectations that it was going to take off. I just, I just wanted to put forth my best effort in putting, putting a visual together for a song that I felt like had some potential. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, what legal avenue did the military use to ask you to take down the video? So I, I was, I was pressured first. I was, I was, uh, bullied, uh, threatened, you know, uh, they came at me, uh, First, when the uh, when the video dropped, because I had two singles that I had put out before that one, uh, which uh, it was the plug called the plug, and the second one was called Brands, and then I dropped Turn Off the Lights. Uh, so I had already released music while I was serving, had no issues at all. Uh, when I released Turn Off the Lights, it had been out for a while too, and I didn't get any backlash from it. It's only when it hit World Star that I started to get, you know, these these uh, these these uh, intimidation factors that they tried to place on me. Uh, you know, I got counseled, you know, where it was like they said in my counseling statement, they said, you know, it's clear that you have musical talent, just use it the right way. Uh, in my counseling, there was never no direct order to take the music off of the internet or anything, uh, you know, and so I took it as, okay, I don't know what you're saying is use it appropriately uh, because where I'm from and where you're from is two different areas, but we're both in the United States, you know, uh, where I grew up and what I listen to is different from what you grew up and what you listen to. 
and I respect where you come from and everything that you believe in and what and what kind of music that you listen to. So who are you to tell me uh, what kind of music that I should listen to? So I left it alone. Uh, mm -hmm. I, a year later, in 2020, is when they doubled back and pulled me into the office and tried to demand me at this point to take the music down. At this point, the music had already been circulating. It's been on Worldstar. It's been on YouTube. Uh, it's been shared on across all social media. Uh, tried to give me an order to take the music down without without giving me any instructions or directions on how you actually want me to achieve this goal. Uh, so, you know, you're asking me to do something I don't have the knowledge to do. And even if I did have the knowledge to do it, what you're asking me to do is is not legal. It's not it's not ethical what you're asking me to do anyway. Uh, so I went through, you know, the attempts to remove it off of my social media, at least because, you know, at the, at a minimum, I would release remove my clips off of social media wasn't good enough. They decided to go ahead and move forward with what is called an Article 15. So for people who are not familiar with an Article 15, the difference between an Article 15 and a court martial is Article 15 is in-house. Article 15 is handled within the military. Uh, it's still legal ramifications. You can still get charged. You still can lose money, but that's where it stops. As opposed to court martial, court martial is like going to court in the civilian side, where if I'm found guilty, they could actually seek and press legal charges against me that can stick on my record, my criminal record. And I didn't want that. So I opt towards an article 15 because I wanted to plead my case and about how I felt like what was going on here was racist and it was discrimination and a violation of my first amendment rights. Uh, but I wanted to give the military, I wanted to afford them the opportunity to show that I was trying to use all of the in-house systems that we have to rectify the problem before it got any bigger than what it was and just like I probably knew it was going to happen, they sided with the individual who brought up the 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 uh, the, the music video being in question in the first place. And so, yeah, they went on ahead and moved with the charges. They charged me with three charges. Those charges were uh, disobeying a direct order to remove my music video off the internet, an order that was never given in the first place. Uh, back when they gave me that order, they they brought up the counseling as evidence for that. And in that counseling which is also included in my packet, there was never any order on that counseling that said, remove your music off of the internet in 2019, when I got that counseling. When the Article 15 dropped in 2020, that's when they brought up, said, hey, I told him to remove his music video, he disobeyed the order. So that's one, that's one charge. The second charge I got charged with was publicly appearing in a music video that brought discredit upon myself in the United States military. How? Don't know, but that's the second charge. The third charge was making money without proper approval, which uh, they eventually threw that one out because it was a hobby and it wasn't making money. It, it was something that I spent my own hard earned money on in my own time to pay the individuals that I wanted to be in my music video to represent my image of myself as an artist the best way that I knew how. Mm -hmm. So um, at your Article 15, did you have an attorney or you represent yourself or did, how, how did that go down? Yeah, I had a I had an attorney. It was a it was a military court appointed attorney through trial defense services, which we know in the military called TDS. Uh, the the uh, the lawyer who was uh, who presented my case uh, was the same rank as me, uh, so I kind of already knew where that was going to go. And she was a woman, uh, so I, I already felt like automatically like they were going to look at her as inferior to them uh, anyway because. Uh, first, she's the same rank as I am, and she's and she's a woman, and we know how that goes uh, mm -hmm. in this in the United States as well. So you know, she's pretty much in the same boat that I'm in, being I'm a captain and I'm black. So it's like, okay, you know, we're kind of we're kind of in the same boat here. Uh, but we we put our our best foot forward. We brought forward all of the evidence that we could possibly think of that we could include it in our packet to show them that there is nothing wrong that what I did. Uh, the decision still came back. Uh, that I was I was charged with two of those charges where they uh, they attempted to take my money from me. They attempted to take pay out of my paycheck. And keep keep in mind they they even seek to do this during coronavirus. So you know throughout people losing their jobs and people becoming unemployed, family members struggling, they cared not for any of that. They still wanted to to come after me and hit me the hardest that they possibly could. Uh, and I told my lawyer, I told her this to her face, uh, which I knew it was going to break the the client uh, lawyer confidentiality, I already told her that if this Article 15 goes through uh, and they approve it, I have every intention on taking this public. 
Uh, and that's exactly what I did uh, because what was going on with me, I felt like was wrong. And I felt like they were trying to keep it behind closed doors. And I wanted the, uh, I want the world to be able to decide, you know, on this, you know, there's mixed, there's mixed opinions and mixed feelings on this situation. You know, I know there's some people who are going to side with the military and there's, there's a lot more people who side with me, but at the end of the day, I still feel like it's a first amendment issue. And this definitely needs to be addressed um, by the, by the world. It needs to be, this needs to be addressed by the world. And if it's going to take me to do it, uh, then I'm willing to stand on, I'm willing to, uh, to follow my sword for it. Yes. And this is what, uh, a couple more things before, uh, uh, what is the stat? Did you appeal? I did. I, I did. I, I appealed it. Uh, I appealed the decision and like almost immediately, I would say like within a week, uh, the appeal was not, uh, was, was, I feel like it wasn't even considered, uh, it, it sustained and they move forward with the Article 15. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, I saw in the uh, military, uh, I mean, I saw in the interview from the LA Magazine uh, where they denied you medical care. What is that about? Yeah, so while I was going through this whole situation um, with the military, uh, you know, I kind of knew they're, you're, you guys are moving towards kicking me out for this. You know, I'm not going to be able to progress in my military career anyway with an article 15 on my record. So that's kind of like a, a death by paperwork sentence on my career anyway. Uh, not going to be able to advance with my peers. I won't be able to get promoted. Uh, and so uh, I have, I had a lot of medical issues. I still do uh, that I was trying to get fixed before I got out of the military. Uh, and what they were doing, they were actively stopping me from being able to seek surgeries and get my stuff fixed uh, because they were, I, I, I still bitter over everything that was going on. Uh, it took an act of, it took me going through patient advocacy, uh, getting the hospital ombudsman involved. I had to go through TRICARE to get my, um, get my doctor changed because they kept changing it back to the unit doctor that was not allowing me to take care of myself. I had so many different uh, surgeries that I, that were needed, that doctors signed notes that, you know, that are, that were telling me, hey, you know, this guy needs to get this stuff fixed. Uh, it's a hindrance on his lifestyle. It's a hindrance on, the, on how he operates. Uh, and ultimately, they would still deny it because at the end of the day, you know, they said it's a commander's decision to approve a soldier's surgery or not. And I knew that the only reason why they were stopping me from getting surgeries was for one, we were in, a, in this battle. They knew what I was doing. Uh, and ultimately, they just didn't care. They just don't care uh, about me as a man and me as a soldier. Uh, and yeah, it took, it took a lot. For me to get that done and even now as i'm processing out because i'm still in i just stop trying to get medical care until i get out there's still things that i need to get fixed on but i'm just um i had gotten so worn out of trying to submit forms to get surgeries and get stuff fixed before i got out i said hey you know what? i'm just going to try to handle this on the veteran side when i get out uh because they're not going to do anything but deny it uh mm -hmm. and and you know um right now it doesn't seem like in that arena i'm getting much help uh in that field right now, as far as trying to get that stuff fixed. How about, uh, um, well, how long is uh, uh, left before the uh, retirement in uh, the military? Now, is it 20 years retirement? What is it uh, to retire? 20, yeah, it's 20. And you that yeah. close? Yep, that close. <laughs> that wow, close. <laughs> well, brother man, no way in the world should you let them push you out this close to you. But let me ask you a couple more things. What have the, um, I know you're down there in um, the Georgia, the Atlanta area, uh, the new senator that we got. Have you been able to touch base with uh, anybody in his office to bring this to the forefront on what's happening? Yeah, I've, I've reached out uh, back when Kelly Loeffner was senator. I launched the congressional. I had her investigate these claims. Uh, they actually came down and they actually investigated the post. Uh, and then I didn't hear nothing about it. Then when Senator John Ossoff and Senator Raphael Warnock took office, uh, I followed back up with Senator Raphael Warnock's office. Uh, I don't, I never got a chance to talk to the man. I tried to reach him. I tried to reach everything. I pushed for you know, a blue state. I used my media platform to try to get people out there to vote, tell them the places that they needed to go to. I reached out to them. His office launched another congressional. 
Uh, and then the Army was just like, hey, you know what? Everything is fine. This guy's good. We're taking care of him. He's getting out. You know, I went back to Congress and I was like, that's not right. That, you know, they're, they're lying to you. Everything is not good. I don't think that you guys are really looking at the severity of this situation. Uh, the response that I got back from Congress was, hey, you know, we don't investigate claims. We just take the case and make you guys talk to each other. So I was like, okay. So congressional is really just a, a, a just toilet paper at this point, because you guys are not, you're not going to step in uh, as a Georgia constituent. You know, if, it, if, 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 I'm, if I'm your constituent, regardless of me being a soldier, I'm not only stationed in Georgia, but my, my you know, I grew up most of my life out here in Georgia. I'm through and through a Georgia constituent, Georgia driver's license. I mean, I am a Georgia driver's license. I am, I am a citizen here, right here, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm a Georgian, but they didn't do anything about it. So now what we have decided to do with me and my legal team, you know, we have drafted up a letter to try to get Congress involved uh, at, at Capitol Hill, uh, addressed a letter to, to President Joe Biden and his cabinet and the individuals who handle uh, governmental affairs uh, and issues that relate to that. And we also are targeting investigative news teams to, to take a, a better look at this because before this situation got to this point, I did reach out to, to um, media teams locally. They took my story. I was interviewed on camera, but then it disappeared. They didn't do anything with it. I used to try to follow up. They didn't hit me back. I used to try to say, hey, are you guys gonna air the story? But journalism is silenced in this town because that town is a military town. That's, t that's the town that brings in most of the money. And if the story doesn't look like it's gonna promote it in a good light, they wash it under the rug. So I went higher than them. So right now what we're working on like that, we got that letter sent off. We're gonna check in with them in a couple of weeks. And then uh, through, the, through the website called The Color of Change, we're gonna start a petition. I have a Facebook group that's created that's got almost 10,000 followers in it uh, with a whole to get it out there and get people to sign it so we can go ahead and start, you know, start the, start the real movement that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely, sir. Uh, need to get out because it's like a 100 year circle. And uh, what I mean by that is the same way that they used to feel about uh, uh, jazz over 100 years ago is the way they feel about uh, hip hop. And uh, so I like to read something. The main thing I want to get into now is I like to talk about how to create a space in the military for hip hop culture, because that, that is our culture. That's why uh, the youngsters uh, are definitely behind uh, me. And I would like to bring up the name Lieutenant Jesse Europe, because this is the only person that I could think of who had a similar situation uh, uh, to yours. And I'm going to read something on uh, 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 James Reese Europe born February the 22nd, 1881, May, and he passed May the 9th, 1919. He was an American ragtime and early jazz band leader, arranger, and composer. He was the leading figure on the American music scene of New York City in the early, 19, early 1900s, 1910s, heading up to the 1920s. U.B. Blake called him the Martin Luther King of music. Now, his military experience was during World War I, Europe attained a commission in the New York Army National Guard where he fought as a lieutenant with the 369th Infantry Regiment, the Harlem Hellfighters, when it was assigned to the French Army. He went on to direct the regimental band to great acclaim. In February and March of 1918, James reached Europe and his military band travel over 2,000 miles in France performing for Britain, British, French, and American military audience, as well as French civilians. Now, after his return home in February, in February of 1919, he stated, I have come from France more firmly convinced that even, that, that convinced 
that uh, more than ever that Negroes talking about African American uh, blacks should write uh, Negro music. We have our own racial feeling, and if we're trying to copy whites, we would make a bad copy. We won France by playing music, which was ours and not a pale imitation of others. And if we are to develop in America, we must develop along our own lines. So uh, that is uh, Jesse Europe, and it's similar uh, similar to uh, 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 yours, Von T, simply because the way that they looked at jazz at that particular time, they thought jazz was too much drugs involved, too much sex involved, too much racial mixing and all that kind of stuff involved. And but what Europe was able to do, because he was the foundation for these great band leaders like Count Basie and Duke Ellington and all of them that came along uh, later on, he was able to create a space in the military for the jazz culture. And that, that's where you have all these big bands throughout the military, all uh, branches of them. And what are your thoughts on uh, 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 the ability for hip hop to do the same thing? Give him just a it second. Got, uh, it kind of got, I kind of lost. We're having a tech issue. He dropped out. He's trying to sign back on. Mm -hmm. But while he's trying to sign back on, you're absolutely right. Back in the day, minstrelsy was viewed as family friendly good stuff, and jazz was terrible, horrible things. He's back. Mm -hmm. So I'll shut up. No, go ahead, Pam. Von T, you back? You good? Can you hear it? Oh. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Some. I I guess I got kind of kicked out of the chat. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Tech's going to tech. It's, it's, it's not you. Can you move back a little bit so we see more of your okay. face and not just your excellent? All right. Uh, Melvin, sir, director, sir, re-ask yes. him that question about jazz and hip hop and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, Pam, um, your comments was, was on uh, par to I'd like for you to ha have a chance to uh, chime in on that, especially talking about the ministry. But um, um, yeah, I read the portion about uh, Lieutenant Yuri, and you and him have so much similarity. A hundred. This is a, a person, it's um, on your defense team, you know, that you got in your orbit. They should always bring this brother up when it comes to the military because he laid the foundation for that at the time when they felt the same way they feel about hip hop, the culture of hip hop, uh, how they connect that to, uh, the, they consider that to be the crazy wild culture coming from uh, African Americans in the inner city or whatever they feel about it. They got too much drugs and sex and all that kind of stuff. It was the same thing with jazz. They felt yeah. that jazz, jazz had too much drugs, too much sex, too much race mixing and all that kind of stuff. But Jesse, Lieutenant Europe, you know, he's the one that stopped putting together these big bands. He started, and he was doing that in the military. And he traveled all over France, England, et cetera, like that. He created a space for jazz within the military that's still there right now, see? And then, uh, uh, so this is what, uh, uh, I, I, I understand clearly the battle that you in because I was reading some of your information and you saw this as an attack on our culture, which is right, hip hop, that's where it come from and all that kind of stuff, see? And so I figured the, the challenge now is how can we get enough people behind us, especially from um, uh, the community, to get them to create a space for hip hop within the military, this new form. What, what are your, some of your thoughts on that? I think we might have frozen. And Pam, you was making a few comments. Uh, we're having, I think he's having some tech issues with Wi-Fi where he is. Mm -hmm. 
um, I'm not sure what I can do to help. I'm sorry, sir. What did you say? <laughs> well, I'm trying to figure out how to help him. You, you were talking about uh, uh, the ministry and how they looked up on jazz doing that. Oh, minstrelsy. Yes. It's one of my black helicopter issues. So minstrelsy back in the day was viewed as good, clean, family-friendly fun. Minstrel shows were in homes. They were in... Um, uh, aud um, what do you call them? Auditoriums, theaters, and families were encouraged to come and see it. Um, whereas jazz, the emerging forms that would eventually become jazz, were uh, viewed upon, as you said, as degenerate, low down, terrible kind of forms of information. The thing is, though, and this is one of the many sad things about. Uh, minstrelsy and blackface um, back in the day, it was viewed as for white people, no, no matter the class, it really doesn't matter lower or upper, it was viewed as a form of information. So Zora Neale Hurston told us, you know, my people, my people, that's how we are sometimes. Minstrelsy stopped at those people, those people, that's how they are. Mm -hmm. And so Vaughn is back and he's connecting and I'm going to stop talking as soon as he's back on. And that, there we go. He's back. I'm mm -hmm. back. Yeah. So Bob, what we were talking about earlier, we read the information on Lieutenant James uh, uh, Europe, who laid the foundation for great musicians that would come later, like uh, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, et cetera, like that. But uh, well, the, the similarity to what you're dealing with now is it, it was almost like a clash of culture then, the way they felt about jazz music is the same way they feel about hip hop. They thought jazz music had too much sex, drugs, et cetera, like that. What are your, uh, some of your thoughts on that, on the hip hop culture? Yeah, I feel like it, I feel like it, it's history repeating itself. You know, it's a false stereotype. It's a false stereotype, and I feel like it's a narrative uh, to try to to try to silence us. It's a narrative to try to silence our creativity uh, and, and try to suppress our culture, and and, it, and it's really a slap in our face. Like it, you know, I feel like I see a lot of similarities in, in what he went through, and uh, what I'm going through. You know, and maybe, you know, this is this is. This has come back around, you know, as history repeating itself. But this time, you know, I plan on taking this a little bit farther. Maybe I'm picking up the picking up where he left off at, and I'm gonna run with it this time. Yeah, so we're gonna get some changes and with some some results this time. It's not it's not gonna happen again. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, uh, you got so many of the young brothers out here that's into the um, hip hop, and if we had some kind of space in the military. For the, that accepted the hip hop culture, I think this would uh, 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 a lot of little youngsters would see this more of an option uh, uh, as opposed to what they're looking at now, especially when they see a fight like this going on. And one other thing, I thought what was so important because you've had a lot of great musicians that went through the military you know, entertainers that went through the military. You just think of Jimi Hendrix. You go down the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the line with that. But the fact, the similarities between you and Lieutenant uh, Jesse Europe is the fact that you are officers and the officers provide the leadership for the military. And I think this will make you so important in relationship to spearheading uh, this particular fight and how important it is to build up a, 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 a movement behind uh, uh, you. Because a lot of things are happening in the military now, and I always push this. I know when Black Lives Matter was pushing this defund the police uh, in these different cities to deal with the economic problems, and I always felt that I liked the concept but I always thought it should be about defunding the big police. When I say the big police, I'm talking about the military, which is uh, over half of the military budget, right? 
uh, uh, over half of the United States budget goes towards the military. And see, and I think that we're heading to a space now where all of those funds and stuff like that, and, uh, uh, when I'm talking about defunding, I'm talking about rearrange, I'm talking about creating a space where all of this money, you know, that can really impact what's happening in, in the uh, communities on the outside. So uh, uh, I had, let me see if I have another uh, question for you. Uh, with, how about, let me get some of your closing, what, uh, uh, Brother George. George Corbin. Yes. Did you have a question from listening to all of this? Did you have I, a question? I, I have a couple of a simple questions. One, where did you go to college? Uh, I graduated from Columbus State University out of Columbus, Georgia. That's where I got my undergraduate degree in criminal justice. Uh, and then I started to seek administration of justice in uh, UAF, the University of Alaska Fairbanks in, uh, in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Yep. All right. Did you have any contact or interest in uh, predominantly black fraternities? Oh, yeah. I'm gonna they would be... Go ahead. Q. I'm, I'm an Omega. You're a Okay, yep. <laughs> I'm not a few. I'm an alpha. But okay. That, I'm an alpha. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As of 1961, so they were in the old days. You've heard Ooh. stories about that. Yeah. Uh, do you have any daughters or children? I don't, and that's that's one of the benefits that I do have that has actually worked in my favor. I don't feel like there's anybody that I know of currently right now that's going, that could be able to bear a lot of the stress that I have. I'm not married. I don't have kids. Uh, you know, you, maybe they picked the right person or the wrong one. I don't know. It depends on how you look at the situation because I don't have anything but time on my hand to make sure that I get it right. And I got, I got one shot of my life to get this right, to make sure that I paint this right for everybody, for, for, the, for the generations that's coming after me on this. Uh even though your military legal support team, you talked about your defense attorney being a female, um, externally, has the ACL, you been involved or are they aware of your issue? Because you've mentioned a couple of times about the um, First Amendment issue. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have yet. I mean, I have been trying to reach out to uh, whatever organization I feel like can hear, will, will hear me and will be responsive. The, the problem that I feel like I've run into with some of these, some of these letter organizations, uh, you know, NAACP, BLM, Black Lives Matter, some of these other organizations that I reach out, I feel like they're, they're, their agenda is so big. I think sometimes like my voice is not heard just because the right, I'm not either targeting the right people or maybe I'm just not, maybe, maybe I just haven't kicked up enough dust yet. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just now starting to get that kind of, that kind okay. of buzz. Behind. Last question. You talked about kicking up dust is, have you had any indication that your issue has been picked up in other countries uh, uh, outside yeah. of the United States. Yeah. The music uh, has. Right? Yeah. So like a lot of, uh, a lot of the group members uh, in my, in the group that I have made, a lot of the comments uh, that I am hearing, you know, that I see, it, it, no organization has, but there's been absolutely like comments from other people in other countries, you know, that say only in America. This doesn't happen in our country, you know, um, you know, we're, we're in this country, we live here, music is shared because, you know, we all live in this country, this is our country's music. Uh, only here, you know, that I, that I run into those problems, you know what I'm saying, but I, I do get comments and, and uh, chimes in from, from people from other countries about this situation. They have joined the group, they have joined the movement in this. Got it, thank you. Mel? All right, George, thank you very much. 
a, a, a couple of things I'd like to uh, mention, Vonti, uh, 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 is uh, the possibility of using your skill set and your story. Your story is such a unique. I can see a hip hop script, a hip hop play, a hip hop music or something like that about your life, about what's happening right now to get it to the forefront, even if it's half an hour or 45 minutes or whatever like that. Because I think we have to use every tool that's available to us to get this out, to get people uh, to support. And so many people listen to hip hop and watching what uh, 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 you guys were able to do in these videos, it's very easy. You, your story is so interesting. I mean, and, uh, uh, George is a uh, writer, playwright, I'm a playwright. We know uh, many writers and et cetera like that. I think this, this is something that um, we're going to have to start looking at also. And then I want to mention, before I give you the uh, closing comments, and then at the end of the show, we're going to, I didn't get a chance to put up the Save Your Dates uh, flyer up. We're going to put that up towards the end. But I want to mention that on Veterans Day, you will be one of the special guests on the uh, show at Veterans Day, for, which is November the 11th. Looking forward to that, to have a good discussion on that also. Uh, yeah. And there's another picture of uh, Jesse Europe that we put up there. But let me give you some close, give us some closing comments, and then I'll uh, close out. I have Pam bring up the uh, save your date information. Uh, closing comments on you, Von D. Just so glad to have you uh, in the studio with us. Uh, you know, yeah. Like if I, if I had to say, you know, you know anything, like I, like I always close with, you know, when I when I talk about this situation, it, it's it's unfortunate. It's uh, it should have never happened in the first place. Uh, it's definitely changed my outlook on what I believe in in this country, but it hasn't changed my resolve. It hasn't changed me as a man. Uh, I don't have any disdain for my brothers and sisters who serve. I still love them. Uh, I still respect the uniform and the soldier. Uh, I still have friends who are serving. I got nephews that are serving. Uh, but I wouldn't, I would say, uh, still keep fighting for what you want to do outside the military. Because what you have to realize, or what everybody has to realize, is that one day you're going to have to hang your boots up. One day you're going to have to figure out what it is. That fighting for whatever it is that you feel like is your version. or is going to put your name or the military or your family in jeopardy, uh, you shouldn't be prosecuted. You shouldn't have, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about looking over your shoulder uh, for championing where you come from. So just keep fighting. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Von T. We're looking, this is where we had a special program. We know that we need to get into this in depth. We'll pick up the subject again on Veterans Day when we can get into an in-depth discussion about the similarities definitely between you and Lieutenant uh, uh, Ure almost a hundred years later. But right now, I would, yeah, I wanna uh, pull up the flyer, save these dates, live Zoom Veterans Day event, November the 11th, 2021 at six o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time, soldier to soldier, uh, my play by Melvin Ishmael Johnson, Casualty of Time, which is a 20-minute film by a Marine Corps veteran, Jeremiah Jahi, uh, a great, excellent piece. And as I mentioned, we, we have four special guests, um, uh, Robert Rosebrock, Highland Bird, uh, uh, Tyrone Robinson, Vaughn T., et cetera, will be our special guests on that day. And then coming up December the 17th, 2021 at 6 p.m., the Nasana Short Play Festival. 
We also will have special guests there. We will have the theme will be celebrating Biddy Mason. We have three plays, three short 20 minute plays celebrating Biddy Mason by Earlene Anthony. Sap and Helpments by George Corman and Justice or Just Us by Lorinda Hawkins Smith. So you can find more information just like you can find the uh, video for today uh, um, on the website dramastage1 at yahoo.com at the website dramastage-coomram.org and uh, uh, George Corbin website playwrightgeorgecorbin.com. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, I would like to extend a special thank to Von T and George Corman. You know, we are looking forward to uh, the Veterans Day uh, event coming up. And you can find a video of today's event within the next 24 hours on dramastage-coomram.org and George website, playwright George Corman.com. Thank you for tuning in to the Coram Report and from your host, Melvin Ishmael Johnson. May the peace and blessings of the life-giving creative spirit be upon you and upon your family. I leave you with a song that opened the show, Homeboy by Sunchi Ali. Homeboy. There's only one blood cousin. Ain't no sense in us trampling on the stones. It's us down, down to the bone. Blood is thick. Waters were known well. Cousins were kept apart. Mothers were often memories. Fathers were not favorites on the farm.